Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Biblical Hope YouTube channel. Vaudois, Le Champion des Dames, 12th century prose manuscript, a sonnet by John Milton, In Sabatati, and Crocs, the footwear. What do all these have in common? Stay tuned. You're watching the Biblical Hope YouTube channel. Today we're going to be looking at the history of the Weld and Seas in ancient history and throughout the Middle Ages. This was a group of individuals that early Christians facing Roman persecution would have fled to the Swiss Alps. This was where these individuals traced their roots. We can see from the ancient biblical story of Abraham and Lot that it was Lot within the city who apostatized. It was Abraham where truth was kept pure. And indeed, Rome, the Roman church, did syncretize with paganism, but it was, we believe, it was this pure church up here in the Swiss Alps that fulfills the story of the woman in Revelation 12 that fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God. And the Waldenses did just that. Adventism itself actually has some strong uh, sense of connection to these ancient Christian believers for the truths that they held dear, and really demonstrates that though Catholicism says, hey, we trace our beliefs all the way back to the time of Christ, there is an alternate belief system that does trace its way back to the time of Christ as well, with a different set of truths that's been heavily persecuted, almost obliterated, but not entirely. So the Wild and Seas were also known as the Poor Men of Lyon, and they were, they were connected in name by Peter Waldo, though their origins are traced back even further in history, like I said, all the way back to the time of Christ. But where they really step on, on the scene in terms of their name is really about the 12th century. The Walden Seas held and preached a number of truths, including the atoning death and justifying righteousness of Christ, the Godhead, the fall of man, the incarnation of the Son, a denial of purgatory, and the invention of the Antichrist, the value of voluntary property. And so we can see here that contrary to Catechism 2408, which places a low value on voluntary property or property rights, Catechism actually teaches that it's okay to take if there's enough need. The Waldenses respected property rights. In fact, Bohemia and Bavaria, Bavaria, there were groups of them that kept the Sabbath with the Jews. Now, it's interesting, you, you know, you can never fully trust Wikipedia because they make a claim here about in sabbatati, sabbatati, or in sabbatati, designation arising from the unusual type of sabo, which was a type of clog, hence the, the discussion on Crocs. Um, I, I personally love Crocs, so uh, having these individuals, uh, I just connect with them even further because I love their clogs as well, but that's beside the point. But let's look at these citations right here. Johann Herzog, we have uh, Spinigi, Vadesi non Observanza del Sabato. So clearly this is, this is already talking about a reference to the Sabbath and showing that this citation is actually incorrect. And then it says Goldastus. Now this is where it becomes abundantly clear that these individuals were keeping the Sabbath. The German Calvinist historian, 1576 to 1635, citation needed. I have that citation right here that Wikipedia lacks. And we'll take a look at that here in just a moment. Um, so this is the citation from Melchior Goldast or Goldastus. And we can see here that he says, Regarding non quod circumcider enter sed quod in sabato judiazerent un sabato sunt dicti valdensium propago. So we can see here that they were called, uh, not called in sabatati because of circumcision, but because they kept the Jewish Sabbath. So this was from his Goldastus Rational Constitutium Imperium. It's available on Google Books. But we can see this further. Of course, Jacob Gretzer, the, the Jesuit author, quoted Calvinisto or Melchior Goldas as he was known and talked about how he referenced it as a Jewish Sabbath. But what we can see here is that he made a claim about the Sotularis. And so <clears throat> he tried to connect it to the Sotularis right here, which was the sandal or clog or crock that they wore. But he said that himself that he didn't really have good evidence to support that claim. He, he, he argued it, but he, was, he really wasn't sure on it. So as you can see here, Adventists tend to take the position of Melchior Goldast, which is that we believe that these individuals kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. In fact, we can see further evidence of this in articles from, for example, uh, Monetai, a, a, a priest in the 12th century. Here we have his book from 1743, where he argued keep the Sabbath. In fact, uh, Joseph Dolinger, here's that quote from the Wikipedia article from his Beträge zur Sechsten Geschichte der Mittelalters. He said here that non nulli vero cum Judea sabbatum celebrant. So not a few with the Jews keep the Sabbath. 
And so uh, clearly there was evidence that these well densities did keep the Sabbath. So let's take a look even further here. Okay, so years ago I had gotten this, uh, ran into some of the Waldensee books and wanted to trace some of their beliefs myself. This was uh, a book available on Google Books and archive.org called Abrégi l'Histoire de Boudoir. It was written by a Waldensee historian known as Pierre Boyer. And we can see here that he mentioned an expl ex explication or an explanation of the Ten Commandments, l'Oration Dominicale, from the year 1120. And <clears throat> so I was curious about this, like, well, what's this, what's this Waldensee prose all about? So this is obviously from the 12th century right here, uh, well before the time of the Duke of Savoy and some of the really heavy persecution of these Waldenses that, that is talked about and apologized by the Catholic Church today. So I wanted to get a copy of this, and I was able to reach out to Trinity College Library in Dublin, Ireland. Their manuscripts and research department was so kind. I think it was because I sent it in an edu address or an .edu email to them. But they were so kind as to send me the entire Waldensee prose from the 12th century. And I was able to go through it, all 400 pages worth of it, to actually look and find their explanation for the fourth commandment. And here was that page that I found. And you can see right here, I've, I've zoomed in on the text from that page. Uh, here is uh, number seven, Dies lo Saba del dio, dio, Signore Dio. So we can see right here that they believe that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord God. This is 12th century Waldensee prose right here, handwritten. Uh, you can read it and, and take a look for yourself right here. But furthermore, this was the English translation from uh, Brégy l'Histoire de Boudoir, and it says, Souviens-toi du jour du repos, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. So clearly, the Waldenses did keep the Sabbath, if you look at the evidence. In fact, uh, Peter Alay, uh, son of the Reformed Church of France, he was born at Lincoln in Normandy in 1641, he says, If it be objected to them that God has commanded the seventh day to be sanctified, they answer that it is for that reason the Sabbath is to be kept, that circumcision is to be kept for the same reason. So they despised the feasts of the church. They didn't keep Sunday, but they did keep the Sabbath. And in fact, I've, I've been looking for this particular quote as well in an original Manuel de l'Inquisiteur by Bernard Gui, um, but he mentioned as well that they were called in Sabbatati because of Sabbath keeping. And Bernard Gui was an inquisitor in around the, the 12th century, 13th century, uh, who did keep uh, or did talk about the Walden Seas keeping Sabbath. Of course, uh, Primitive Christianity in William Cave, this particular version published in 1672, said that, uh, of course, there were, there were quite a few early Christians going back even before the time of the Walden Seas who did keep holy the Sabbath day. So let's go back here to our our discussion on what happened to these individuals as a result of these peculiar beliefs that they held true. So we can see here that there were illustrations in, for example, the Champion des Dames by Martin Lefranc in 1451. Here we have the Vidoises depicted as these witches. Now, from their own writings, uh, from their own Waldensee prose that I've obtained, you, know, you read through their beliefs, these were not witches at all, but they were depicted as such in kind of an ecclesiastical Mein Kampf by individuals, Catholic individuals and papal individuals. Of course, Pope Innocent VIII himself put out a hit on these folks by giving plenary indulgence to anybody who should go persecute them. And this unleashed a storm of persecution against these individuals. So I would submit that in order to understand the true depth of the persecution, one really has to examine their beliefs first to see were they biblical, were they correct, to determine what to accept in terms of whether the persecution numbers were correct from Catholicism or whether it was correct from Protestants and these individuals right here. But let's move on further here. I want to first introduce a book uh, from William Spicer, The Hand That Intervenes. This was an old book. I used to have a collection of it. He published it in originally around uh, 1918, and it was a wonderful book that told the stories of how God intervened for these early Christians, the Waldenses, uh, the Protestants in general, and how God saved them from destruction time and time again. So that's our one of our book promos for today. And if we move on here, of course, uh, Adventists have long talked about the Waldenses. Chapter 4 of the Great Controversy was entirely designated to these ancient Waldenses. <clears throat> 
Let's take a look at here at this YouTube clip. We're gonna just watch it briefly here. So this was the location of the College of the Barbs by the ancient Walden Sea, some of the persecution that they faced from their persecutors. The College of the Barbs, though, was a place where the Walden Seas, a very humble place where the Walden Seas came and translated the Bible and <clears throat> spent quite a bit of time sewing it into their clothing and taking it all around Europe, spreading the truth. This was not some kind of fancy cathedral, but it was very humble, very much like the stable that Christ was born into. Very humble, like, like Christ himself. And the College of the Barbs, this was located in the Prado Torno of Italy. This was where Walden Seas faced um, quite a bit of persecution up in these valleys, and this was where they would have gone for refuge. So let's move on here to uh, a book by J.A. Wiley, published in the 19th century. And he talked about some of the persecution that you don't see rec talked about in Wikipedia. This was from Catanio. Uh, Catanio, in his memoirs, uh, he talked about uh, how they would uh, hurl headlong anybody uh, who should attempt. The, it, it would cost them little effort to hurl headlong down the precipices anyone who should attempt to scale them in order to reach the entrance of the cavern. So the wild end sees try to defend themselves from attack by using the Alps to their advantage. But, but Catania came and in one case built a big fire around the entrance of one of the caves and suffocated about 400 infants and about 3,000 Vaudois, including the entire population of Val-Louis. So we can see here that, that it wasn't just the massacre of Piedmont that the Catholic Church apologized for, but many... There were many uh, crusades that were sent against them. The most famous one, though, was the Massacre of Piedmont, because when they did find these folks in the cave uh, during the Massacre of Piedmont in around the 1650s, they hauled them all out and tossed them over the cliffs. Mother, infant, child, the whole lot of them. And we see John Milton responding with his sonnet, uh, Sonnet 18, Avenger, Lord, thy slaughtered saints. On the late massacre of Piedmont, avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the Alpine mountains cold, even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worship stocks and stones. Forget not in thy book record their groans, who were thy sheep and in their ancient fold, slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled mother with infant down the rocks, their moans, the veils, redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven, their martyred blood and ashes so, o'er the Italian fields where still doth sway the triple tyrant, that from these may grow a hundredfold, who having learnt thy way, early may fly the Babylonian woe. So clearly John Milton recognized Babylon as Romanism, as do the Adventists do today. Um, but there was not, they were not, uh, this was not limited to simply the massacre of Piedmont, but of course we have the massacre of the Merhendol, which thousands were sent away to the galleys. So when we look at these, how these add up, and it's, it's quite a lot of massacres and persecution. We can see over time, when we look at the numbers, how uh, the, the estimates of the number killed by the papacy in the Middle Ages and later did actually add up to Protestant claims. The 50 million figure, of course, it's it tossed around. It goes, in some cases, as high as 100 million. But what really gets quite uh, intriguing or quite uh, supports the figures. Actually, when you look at the statistics of population growth, how in some cases there were four million of these individuals who thought the same, but after the persecutors came through, it would be reduced in some cases to 400,000 or even far less. So there were millions of these individuals who were persecuted by the church. Um, the links to this particular document and others will be in the in the description, in the video description, so you can take a look for yourself. But I want to play this clip right here. This was, uh, of course, the apostasy, Keepers of the Flame. We can see here how the ancient valleys were used in a defensive pattern. And in some cases, when these crusades were brought against them, there were village, village after village that was destroyed by the papacy. This was the Prado Torno right here. This was the College of the Barbs right here, where the Bible was translated. And uh, we can see here that Catania, you know, he brought his troops against these individuals. They would have spent their time in humble caves, far different from the cathedrals of Romanism. This would have been the wilderness. This would have been exactly what Revelation 12 was talking about. And it must have been a time of, 
of fear and and uh, persecution, but they held true to their faith. We can see that there were times when the Walden Seas prayed and there were clouds that would sweep down after their prayer into the valley, causing confusion amongst Catania's army. And then they would push rocks off the cliffs down against their persecutors. But in many cases, they faced bitter, bitter persecution in the Castelluzzo of the, the mountains. And they were finally discovered here and tossed over this cliff right here. And that's, of course, where we see John Milton's sonnet. So going back to our original debate on the forum that we've had, um, we can see that the Walden Seas did indeed face lots and lots of persecution, not just in 1650 by the Duke of Savoy, but uh, throughout their years. And in some cases, they were burned alive, disemboweled, um, horribly mutilated. They, you know, d just absolutely horrible atrocities were committed against them. Uh, this is another book promotion here, Brave Men of the Battle, Virgil Robinson. Uh, a fantastic book available on Google Books, and the link will be in the description as well. But this was an amazing story of how, in some cases, there were 18 men against 1,000, or they, there were really small minorities that fought off huge waves of men sent against them. There were stories like David and Goliath of old where captains were, were cut down by Waldense youth, and we can see here how some of their leaders, people like Henry Arnaud, really did some fantastic deeds, uh, some fantastic exploits in defense of biblical truth and this church that truly the gates of hell, when you look at the persecution that they suffered, did not succeed against these individuals. Rome was never able to fully wipe them out. And these were poor individuals up in the mountains and got their villages destroyed time after time but their motto stands today, Lux lucid in tenebris, light shines in darkness. And indeed, these individuals were that church in the wilderness for 1260 years of papal supremacy. Folks, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Send in your likes, comments, uh, dislikes. If, if you've got some disagreement, share with me. I want to hear your thoughts. Thank you for watching the Biblical Hope YouTube channel.